All right, welcome everyone to today's APMM Model Maker Meetup. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, today we'll be discussing a new book uh, called Modeling the Metropolis by Matthew Wells. Uh, he's a lecturer in architectural history at the University of Manchester and a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. And we have two special guests as well that are joining us, David Lund, who's a senior lecturer in model making and design and research ethics advisor at the Arts University of Bournemouth, and also Scott Miller, who's the workshop manager of the B15 model making workshop at the University of Manchester. So I think without further ado, I will say welcome to everyone there. And Matthew, if you'd like, you can go ahead and say hello and get started. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you to uh, Michael and to Bruce for uh, organizing all of this and, and, and inviting me along. And obviously, of course, thank you as well to Scott and, and David for agreeing to um, agreeing to 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 be their uh, interlocutors uh, after I've given a, a talk. Um, I've got I'm going to share my screen with you guys now. And I've got some slides which kind of give an overview of the book. Um, and I will try to not speak for more than 30 minutes, but it might be just over 30 minutes. So I apologize in advance. Um, and I need to share my screen, which I've completely forgotten how to do it on Zoom. There we go. That's OK. <laughs> cool. And then presumably everyone can see. Yep. Um, yeah, cool. Fantastic. And you can see the whole screen, right? Yes. Fantastic. OK. Um, so I've said thank you to everyone. This is a cover of the book. Um, what I'm going to do is just give you um, a kind of introduction to the book and then an overview of the chapters. And hopefully this will bring out enough uh, for us, for, for Scott and David and I to talk about um, afterwards. Um, so the book, the book begins um, aptly enough for uh, an American audience. The book begins with the story of an American, the novelist Henry James, leaving the US taking a ship over to Liverpool and catching a train down to London, where he writes uh, an essay where he describes how he can't, um, he can't understand London, that it's this complex, messy, complicated city. And this is because London was, in many ways, uh, the major city of the 19th century, the centre of um, Governance, governance uh, both colonial but also national governance, uh, center of capital um, in, in financial terms, uh, as well as being a place with a kind of developing, well, a kind of large scale industry, uh, expertise, uh, and so on. Um, and London at this time in the mid 19th century, or the late 19th, towards the late 19th century, was more. Uh, more cut about, more changed, more developed, more expanded, both uh, its buildings, its streets, its suburbs, its infrastructure uh, than anywhere else in the world. And the argument of the book uh, essentially is that architectural models were the means by which um, architects, politicians, uh, various other members of building industry and the public um, kind of could understand and comprehend the city and the vast changes that were happening uh, in real time and had happened uh, over the course of the century. Um, it, we chart, it kind of begins, it charts with uh, thinking about how models entered the kind of popular consciousness. Um, exhibitions like this are kind of uh, a pseudo governmental exhibition held in a big tent. Um, at the uh, at Woolwich Arsenal, a kind of major garrison uh, just on the on the north bank of the Thames, but towards the south, um, on the, the south uh, east of the city. Um, sorry, south bank of the Thames, but south of the city, um, and a major exhibition of different types of models that were on display. Many of which related to Britain's kind of military conquests on land and on sea. Um, through equipment, but also large scale um, landscape models of newly conquered territories and visitors kind of every day, um, the middle classes and the upper classes could come and visit this display of objects. And this is one of the ways in which these models entered a, a kind of popular consciousness. The other way is through objects acquired on grand tours. So 
architects uh, and artists, amongst others, made uh, holidays, made grand tours to Europe, uh, at the, most at the end of the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century, where they studied antique architecture. So this is architecture uh, in Greece, in Italy, uh, in, in modern day Turkey, Syria, other places like this in the Middle East. And they often brought uh, home drawings and models of the of the, the buildings they discovered uh, and it's related to as i'm sure many of you will know a particular um, a lot of these models were made of cork to show that kind of ruination in a kind of popular model making technique that emerged out of a um, actually a, a kind of catholic uh, almost reliquary culture of, of making objects um, and we see examples of this very famously in, in the model room at St. John Soane's house. And I'll come back to that later, but this is just to show you this is the first version of the model room. There is a second version um, later on. The introduction also of the book also begins to set up a kind of uh, a wider theoretical context to models in the 19th century. So on the one hand, the observation of architectural models and models uh, at events like the Great Exhibition, where uh, famously uh, the German architect Gottfried Semper analysed a supposed model of a um, primitive hut from the Caribbean. Um, and with it formulated a new kind of theory of modern architecture. Um, the kind of um, post-colonial readings of this object uh, suggest a very different kind of reality to it, but this is clearly one of the ways in which theories uh, travelled. Um, as well as this at the Great Exhibition, there were also enormous, amazing models. This is actually my favourite model in the whole book, um, a model of the docks and the town of Liverpool that was constructed specially for the exhibition by architectural assistants. So young assistants and pupils of architects in the city who made this model by surveying the whole city. They went around and then they drew, take, took their small drawings of the elevations of the whole of the town and then uh, pasted them onto wooden blocks and assembled them in this enormous, um, this enormous um, site model of the, of, of, the, of the city, which was then taken down to the Great Exhibition and put on display in the main um, foyer. And uh, like many site models, often models we see perhaps for developers today, uh, several of the major monuments of the city were outlined. So the town hall, uh, the major concert hall, all of the, tra the several train stations that are very significant to the city. These were kind of made very particular, very, um, uh, very precisely. But also there was a whole sweep of uh, the Docklands that was made all the way running along uh, Liverpool's seafront. Again, showing us this relationship uh, that models can have in the projecting of narratives. On the one hand, the kind of architectural monuments and the connection through these railway stations back to the nation of the UK or Britain, to be more precise. And then also the Docklands showing us again this a kind of commercial aspect. And it, this um, model is used as an example to show the ways, uh, even though it's not of London, showing the example by which models could communicate with different audiences and produce particular narratives, kind of localism. The book then, uh, after this kind of context is established, the book then goes on to try and uh, explore these ideas in different spatial settings. This is both a kind of uh, a very uh, easy chapter structure for someone to write a book through. You just imagine a space and project different kind of case studies into it. But also it allowed me and allows the book to very, very, um, very, very closely examine particular situations by which uh, architectural models were made, uh, were talked about, uh, were exhibited, uh, etc., and how they moved uh, in different ways and were used in different ways in society. Uh, a colleague recently told me she thought that the, you know, the, one of the biggest things that this book does is it tries to go uh, away from just the model as a representational object, that the model just represents the idea of the architect and actually looks at its role much more in different ways in society, which I think is probably something all of you guys will be uh, very familiar with through your work. So the first, um, the first uh, chapter looks very directly at this idea of the public sphere. So thinking about the way in which architectural models were used in and by the public through the, uh, the kind of production or the discussion of the built environment. Um, 
one of the major case studies that it draws on is this model on the left uh, made by the model maker Richard Day uh, in the 1840s, which is a, a kind of semi um, a fragmentary model, the front of a, um, a stock exchange, essentially a, a neoclassical stock exchange that's built uh, in the city of London, right at the center of the city of London, right at the kind of zenith of commercial power in uh, in Britain. And this, uh, this chapter looks uh, at this model both as a design object. So uh, the model is actually, you'll see here, it has a kind of double columnation of the bay. It's got two rows of columns. The original design by the architect had only a single column uh, and was considered too flat and very ugly in lots of ways in its discussion in the press. Uh, and the, this model is, is made by Richard Day and then is presented in lots of different settings by which the design is um, examined and debated by different audiences. And in this image on the right, we see one of those um, situations. So this is this model here of the portico. Um, and this is Prince Albert, um, who is laying the foundation stone for this building. And whilst the building might not exist just yet, because everyone is in this, uh, you know, thousand or so people are inside this enormous tent that's been constructed by the architect in order to uh, witness this ceremonial event. The model stands, and there's a second model of the back of it as well, a model of the building stands uh, as a kind of testimony to the building that's going to come, a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of witness testimony for what the public have been promised. Models were used in lots of other ways. So, for instance, in the competition for the Royal Courts of Justice, again, another major public building, um, which is very precisely located between the city of Westminster and the city of London. London, as you know, is probably, as you probably know, is made up really of these two uh, urban centres. Uh, a model, a series of models were made as a part of the competition entry to show um, different architects approach to a very complicated site with a slope, it's a whole, in fact, it's like a double urban block, uh, a very complicated brief um, of a multiple kind of layers, as you get in a courthouse, multiple layers of uh, the public coming in to, the, to view the legal proceedings, the um, lawyers coming in from another entrance to view, to kind of enact the legal proceedings, the judges who have their own uh, private chambers or in private rooms coming in from another place, um, as well as often defendants and other things as well. And these multiple different um, complexities of program and site were best presented through a series of architectural models um, that went on um, display in a government uh, building uh, nearby to the proposed site where the, where the courts were going to be built. Um, this this um, this competition entry didn't win by Seddon, this, this kind of neo-Gothic thing didn't win, um, but rather interestingly, uh, the model has disappeared, but we have photographs of it. And we know that quite clearly there was a moment where um, whilst the model was being displayed for the public as a part, alongside a whole other series of models of this building as a part of the competition, we know that photographs, including this photograph, were put on display in two different architectural exhibitions elsewhere uh, in, in London. Um, again, showing us different ways in which audiences interacted with it. So there was a display at the Royal Academy where uh, it was it would have been um, put on the wall, not alongside um, paintings and sculptures, but nearby to them. Uh, and again, a kind of more general uh, audience would have come to visit this. But we also know photographs of it were in other architectural exhibitions at the same time. And here again, we begin to see the way different forms of media like photographs are enabling models to move around uh, the city. Um, the um, the uh, second chapter moves on to think about the political sphere of the House of Commons and the idea of, of, um, of kind of uh, central government becoming involved further in these uh, debates over the city, uh, of, uh, over London as a city. Um, the second chapter uh, takes its cue um, from a series of reform acts that gave uh, men the vote across the course of the 19th century um, and begins to think about um, the role that popular politics begins to play in the interactions with the built environment and architectural models. So um, just as the city 
had been mapped. So just as London had been mapped through an ordnance survey, so through um, uh, cadastral mapping uh, in, uh, in the 1850s, by the 1860s, there was a desire for a series of urban scale uh, models to be produced um, centrally by the government, by the kind of federal government of the UK, um, produced by Royal Engineers. Uh, and these models would allow um, public buildings and uh, sites own, so you know, um, potential plots for buildings to be put on to be um, considered and displayed by the public. There was one for Whitehall that survives and you see in front of us and it's absolutely enormous. Um, it's six or seven feet long, if I remember rightly. Um, there was another one for the Strand and the area around the Royal Courts of Justice, which is the court complex I showed you a minute ago. And these models were put on display uh, in the, the House of Parliament, but also in other venues like the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Bethnal Green uh, Museum, which is uh, another uh, offshoot of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And um, what we see here is a whole suite of kind of public offices for different government administrative departments, these complexes that would be linked from one another with these enormous corridors and allow uh, allow um, different um, different departments to interact with one another. And obviously this is Trafalgar Square at the bottom and at the top is Parliament Square. And this is Whitehall. This is really uh, the central part. Again, there are other themes we can draw out of this model clearly, uh, as well as the Royal Engineers making this model. There's also a clearly a huge military element to this with this enormous parade ground in the center uh, of the building, as well as um, um, the, there's kind of other themes related to um, potential sites for underground transport networks that are being constructed at either end of, of, the, of the model. Um, Models also began to take on a, on a, on a kind of different, at a different scale, began to take on a, a different role in, um, in individual, the construction of individual buildings like uh, this government department, the government building for the Admiralty and War Office. Um, we see here models at two different um, scales. Um, the right hand side, the model is incredibly, um, it's, it's maybe one to, um, in metric scale, it's maybe one to uh, 400. I think, if I remember rightly, um, and what this is, this is uh, a sim. This is again, I think, made by Royal Engineers, and it's a series of wooden blocks with drawings pasted on top of them, uh, rather than kind of um, every individual detail uh, produced. Um, on the left hand side, we see a model made in plaster. It's better than this photograph actually allows. It's an incredibly beautiful. Maybe it's a one to one hundred and twenty or one to ninety. I forget what scale exactly it is. Uh, model of just one corner of this um, building uh, made by um, the maybe uh, Charles Henry maybe a model maker uh, whose family mostly is a part of a dynasty of architecture of, of I would say of model makers but also people who um, model making was only a side pursuit they often worked um, they worked a lot more in architectural sculpture so there are other examples where they design they, they produce the sculpture for a major building, but they also produce the architectural models at the same time uh, in, in their work. Um, and this model, uh, these models became a really central uh, debate um, or central part of debates around whether the building should be constructed, how much uh, the value of the building, both financially and its kind of design uh, in a series of kind of a, a series of um, uh, committee meetings that took place uh, towards the end of the 19th century showing us uh, and the model kind of again it stands in for the actual building but it's used very much as a these models were used very much as a tool of rhetoric to enable uh, politicians and civil servants and uh, so government administrators and architects to debate things that didn't exist yet. Um, and just to say again, there's a question of you know, this question of scale. There's also models being made at one to one. You know, we think of those as mock-ups, um, but this is um, a model. There was a model, um, a one to one timber mock-up of Cleopatra's needle, an ancient Egyptian sculptural object that was uh, taken from Egypt by the British, sailed, um, 
sailed by boat uh, essentially to London, uh, where whilst it was en route, a one-to-one -one mock up was placed in Parliament Square, right in front of the Palace of Westminster, um, to see its kind of effects urbanistically within the site. Um, many of you will know that this object is, isn't actually in this location, it's located uh, further down, maybe a mile and a half away on the embankment, um, because this um, site is exactly where a new uh, underground train line that we just talked about uh, it would be laid uh, and the the point load of the of the of the the, the real sculpture would have collapsed through uh, the tunnel as tunnels were constructed at that time um, and it's interesting that again you know we don't have so many records of this uh, happening but again this is um this is a, a um, um, we don't have records of the object the model um, of the timber object itself, but what we do have is representations of it in the popular media. So even if you're not one of the people we see in, say, the foreground of these images, we actually, if you'd bought a copy of the Illustrated London News on that day in 1878, you would have been able to see the effects of this model uh, in London. Oh, uh, in the third chapter, I go to try and uh, go into a, a space that I, I claim is a new space. For, for architectural models, that is the courtroom. And I begin to think about the ways in which architectural models um, enabled um, lay members of the public, architects, engineers, surveyors, to um, contest uh, legal discrepancies around um, light, around planning, around trespass um, within, within buildings. Uh, and within London itself. Again, London, as it had urbanized dramatically in the 18th and 19th centuries, these kind of conditions for um, an enjoyable city, you know, uh, had emerged, that there were rules that governed certain ways in which buildings could be constructed and how the built environment should exist in order to protect people's rights. Again, uh, as I'm sure you guys know, Britain uh, and the preserve of private property is kind of a central tenet to it. And that these model and, and the ways in which the chapter looks at the ways in which different models, uh, many of which produced by John Thorpe, who um, I'm sure David has uh, spoken to you guys about, um, came to uh, came to be a central part of of these of this new role or this new debate. Um, and these objects even changed the architecture of the courtroom itself. So this is a courtroom from the. Durham in the north of England, not London. But what we see is in the center of this image in a circle is uh, a disc. And on this disc, um, the report of this new courtroom described, uh, models could be placed on this disc and they could be rotated to show the judge, the jury, um, different um, permutations as architects and engineers gave evidence uh, about particular issues in, in the built environment. Um, and this was a very, um, one of the aims of the book is to look beyond just, shall we say, design of, as one of the, one of the sole or individual design as one of the sole, um, uh, one of the sole, uh, activities of the architect and to think again, think a little bit more about the architect as being a professional and the different services that they, um, enact in society and this kind of the ways in which expertise around the built environment um, kind of transmitted through architectural models in courtrooms were a kind of key part of that. The fourth chapter looks at the exhibition and exhibition culture in London, um, thinking in particular about the Royal Academy exhibition, which is the Royal Academy summer exhibition. It's the major kind of salon of um, art uh, architecture in, in the UK, and it still is today. Um, half of the chapter, is dedicated to um, a series of models that William Burgess, a, 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 an architect and a, a, an artist, produced for the decoration of St Paul's Cathedral. Models that, um, when they were put on display in the Royal Academy, caused an uproar. On the one hand, because of the particular denomination of Christian symbolism that they represented, but on the other, the way the models had been made. 
So um, this is a sectional model. On the far left, you see a sectional model. So light came into this model from the wrong direction and the public didn't understand it. It has a whole series of clear story windows at the top of this model. Um, but these are made, these are meant to obviously be stained glass windows in reality. But when they were made in the model, they, uh, they were uh, made from opaque paper and there was no light coming in from them. So it became this huge scandal um, both within um, within public, you know, popular society, but also within uh, the Church of England itself and within St Paul's Cathedral, um, leading to a situation where these models that Burgess had uh, worked, one of his assistants and a painter and a carpenter had made together, um, ended up being stripped of all of their um, all of their ornament, which is then stuck in a sewer scrapbook. You see that in the middle. Um, these scrapbooks survive in uh, the collection of, of St Paul's. The models were then reused after Burgess had been kicked off the job and lost the commission. The models were then reused by later architects, but Burgess, um, desperate to regain the, the, this kind of enormously important commission, um, instructed Axel Haig, who was a, basically a render artist, a kind of perspectivist, um, to produce a series of drawings that show St Paul's with this decoration exactly how um, Burgess kind of intended the real atmosphere. And this story becomes one of the ways in which this, there is a kind of tension between how models were used and understood compared to drawings uh, in, in, in the 19th century. Um, the chapter also looks at um, Edward Schroeder Pryor um, and the ways in which um, models became to become um, the making of models the kind of physical, tangible um, construction of models by architects um, became to be a, a kind of key part of architectural practice right at the end of the 19th century, as they began to try to gain authorship over both uh, the, the model as a material object and the concepts that it um, that it that it that it um, demonstrated. Um, as part of um, connection to a wider arts and crafts culture where the relationship between the kind of the act and, and, and the hand, you know, the, the kind of brain and the hand became uh, important. Um, and Schroeder, um, so Pryor put this um, model on display at the Royal Academy. It was incredibly um, uh, discussed in the press, it had split opinion, and then he published uh, a long form uh, essay that it described why, you know, architects should make models, they need to be closer to the ways in which materials are worked, they need to be like uh, sculptors thinking about how they operate. And he has a whole series of kind of uh, technique based ideas around how um, a kind of reality could be, um, could be, could be um, depicted through model making. Uh, techniques. It's more conceptual, conceptual than practical, but again, it kind of it indicates a very clear uh, separate, a very, a very clear conceptual um, step at the end of the 19th century. And um, the fifth space, I'm going to try and speed up. I'm so sorry. The fifth space uh, looks at the model makers workshop. Um, it kind of looks in particular at two model makers um, or two workshops of model makers operating. So on the one hand, it looks at um, the construction of the Dorchester, uh, the, a model involved in Dorchester House. This was a, a, a big townhouse um, built uh, on, the, on Park Lane in the centre of London. Um, and it looks at the work of um, Richard Day, um, Richard, and Richard Day Jr., a uh, kind of Day model making dynasty um, who operated um, at that time. Um, Day Senior and Day Junior had had um, architectural models displayed um, in places like this, the kind of popular uh, gallery of practical science. Um, they had made models that we saw earlier for the Royal Exchange, the Stock Exchange I talked about right at the beginning. They put models on in their own right uh, at the Royal Academy, at the Great Exhibition. Um, and um, there's a, they made a whole series, three or four models, um, out of uh, this building of Dorchester House, um, none of which survive. So this chapter becomes, or this part of the chapter becomes an exercise of trying to reconstruct a model maker's practice without the material objects uh, around. Um, Day Senior died within a month or two of gaining the commission. So Day Junior takes over the job 
Uh, and we know from, we have a whole series of letters to the architect, Louis Volume, from Day, where he describes certain things about his life, uh, his model making workshop, uh, he's got to move his mother because his father has now died. Um, we have a whole series of letters where we know exactly, uh, so on the right hand side here, there's two kind of uh, ledgers where the architect, uh, who's, um, should we say a pedant to some extent, itemized every single act that happened to these particular models over time, the ways in which um, they were changed and enlarged or different details and things were added to them. We have letters back from the model maker to the architect saying, uh, I need a drawing where, if you can see just on the left hand side of the left image, uh, I need a drawing where you cut exactly, you cut a section exactly through this keystone, because if I don't have it, I don't know exactly what you want. Or, um, you know, he would make, the model maker would re make requests, I really need, um, I really need you to send me the drawings at the right scale. I really need you to send me the drawings on time, um, etc., and things like this. And these models, which were made of plaster, were not set objects. They were not models that were then made, shown to the client, the, so the, the major client of the building or shown to the architect and then left. But really, these plaster models were um, were constantly reused and reinvented and different iterations were tried on them uh, over uh, several years of the building uh, whilst it was even on site. Um, and we know about all of, also these letters tell us all about all about the horrors of um, a model maker's life when he he's working late at night and he drops the model on the floor and he damages it and he has to start again and yeah i i had some pity for um day junior during this um, and then the second half of this chapter looks at a very different situation i think uh, the thorpe workshop which you know david has has done lots of great work on and, and continues to do work great work on and, and looks in particular at their models of old london how these uh, how these this kind of series of antiquarian models of London kind of preserved the city in a particular way, how they were received by the public, and also how people uh, used them to position London that was in a, a in a, um, in almost in a transnational context. So these models, uh, it was described, became very very important for settler colonialists coming from South Africa or Australasia back to the UK to see these models in certain exhibitions and how they would understand. Uh, London and how the city uh, emerged uh, across, um, you know, from the 16th, the 17th, the 18th century as this bastion of, of um, colonial capitalism. Um, right, I will be very quick. Um, the sixth chapter looks at the university. It looks at uh, the emergence, first of all, in education of model making handbooks that come uh, from Germany, they often come from art practice or they're related to anatomical developments and then traces them into um, uh, a book that was published uh, in the mid century for architectural assistants, so students essentially to learn how to make models because there are all of these new um, opportunities, all of these new public buildings, not just in London, but all around the UK and further afield that were being constructed with all these competitions where models were being required. And so there's, there's a kind of new demand for this technique and these skills. And this amazing book um, shows you how to make a whole different series of models. It tells you how to make cardboard. It tells you how to go to the chemist to produce to uh, procure mica so you can make windows and it gives you all of this range of different um, of, of different techniques that, that can be learned. Um, and then the, the chapter begins to trace some of these ideas directly into um, architectural kind of formalized architectural education as it develops from the mid to the end of the 19th century and beyond looking at collections of models that were um, acquired by different universities, combined at different universities, and how architectural models became a part of pedagogy, um, whether that was um, through um, um, through the kind of seeing new technical specimens, whether it was going to see particular models in, in, in person, whether it was um, um, copying from architectural models, there was a lot of kind of drawing that took place through viewing and observing architectural models rather than on site um, and looks at these in different ways as kind of architectural practice began to kind of further define, it, de define itself uh, in light of the major changes in the 19th century um, and looks at some of the kind of collections of models like um, the casts um, of the Royal Architectural Museum, which were confusingly at the Victoria and Albert Museum and then moved to the Architectural Association and looks at certain model makers who also taught 
um, modeling at um, in university. So someone like Pomeroy here, Frederick William Pomeroy on the right is a, is a sculptor primarily, quite a high, high end, uh, as high end as the British can be at sculpting. Uh, sculptor in the 19th century. He's a Royal Academician, um, but he also is producing architectural models occasionally for major architects um, for built and unbuilt projects. And Pomeroy teaches a class in one of the universities in London, where a lot of what he's doing is teaching relief sculpture through modeling, but it's also, we know, because there are reports of it in, in the press, where he's teaching sessions where they're really working with clay and he's giving demonstrations about how light and shade operate and work through architectural ornament, through uh, uh, models that he's kind of teaching with the students. Um, the seventh and final chapter goes on to look at the museum and thinks about, again, the emergence of this particular building type. You know, it did exist before the 19th century, but really we know that the kind of popular consensus, consciousness and the museum uh, really emerges in the 19th century. Uh, thinking, um, first of all, about emerging architects, museums like uh, the Sony Museum, how this was formed, why this was formed, the different iterations that the museum took on, its different identities. Um, and then moving to think about major public museums like uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum, so the South Kensington Museum, which um, was really this whole, was, a, was a, a whole host of buildings and, comp and, and um, a whole host of buildings and institutions rather than uh, just kind of the singular entity we see now. Um, visitors would come in through this kind of little gatehouse we see on the right into these objects called the Brompton Boilers. And within them, there were a whole series of different um, art and design collections, including uh, the Museum of Art Ornamental Art, which was where the kind of classical models were displayed um, within, within the museum. Um, and it, there were kind of particular curatorial strategies that took place in these museum in this, in this space. So um, there's a whole series of um, Plaster of Paris uh, Fouquet models. So these are models made by the Fouquet father and son duo who were operating in Paris at the turn of the 19th century. Um, Sohn also has some has some on here. These his uh, white plaster models are almost always Fouquet models, um, and these models were kind of lined up uh, on plinths. Surrounding them um, is one to one scale cast models of the ornament that could be found on these antique buildings, and then also on the walls on the far right hand side of the photograph are photographs of uh, these buildings in their current state of ruin. So there's this kind of series of kind of temporalities that are being taken through the display of these models from the kind of perfect white plaster form, the one-to-one -one in large detail almost, or I guess the shrunk scale model and the one-to-one, -one, um, the one-to-one -one ornamental object, and then the photographs that remind you of the present day condition of these. Um, and the whole aim of this museum was to kind of was to educate uh, workers, in particular art, art workers, um, about particular tastes and styles in architecture, in order to train them both technically, but also to train their um, their interests and, and and desires within it. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. I'm sorry it was so long. Um, I. The book is available in all good bookshops and all good university libraries, I hope, but also there's an open access PDF um, if you're interested online on um, on the Vlog on the publisher's website where you can get uh, you can you can click on this and you can download it and there will be a proper website an individual um, HTML page website for it in in only a few months that you'll be able to scroll very nicely on your iPad. Uh, the PDF is not bad, but the, I'm looking forward to seeing the HTML page. Um, but I'm going to shut up now because I think I've said too much. So thank you very much for your uh, patience. Well, thank you very much, Matthew, for sharing that with us. That's awesome. Uh, if you get a chance when the when the link goes live, if you could shoot that to us, we'd be happy to share it with our with our members. So it might get out to a few more eyeballs. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, well, we'll move to the next little step here in which we're going to let Matthew and David and Scott chat about the subject that we just covered a bit uh, between them. And then with the with our closing moments toward the end, we'll open it up for some audience questions. So if you guys want to go ahead and feel free, take it away. Matthew, I'll go first and Scott. Um, I've got a question I want to ask 
for both uh, Matthew and Scott to 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 talk about. I suppose first of all is there's a there's a current of research in this book which um, I know featured as also featured in your earlier sort of research into this Matthew that this period where the model is becoming used a lot more coincides with the professionalization of architectural practice. So in in here in Britain you have the RIB well originally the it's not royal first is it there's the, there's the the RIBA gets one more and in sort of the 1830s and then we're sort of running through this period and I'm I suppose I'm curious both historically in terms of Matthew's research but also Scott working today why what your views are on why this association with architectural practice and the architecture model is so solid because we see in renaissance europe when architecture forms out of stone masonry we see it again here why do you think that was happening then and i suppose for scott specifically why today why are we still doing this why is it that you have this amazing workshop in manchester training new generations of architects using models um I might, I'll jump in on that, Matt. <laughs> um, I actually, I'd written, um, I kind of copied a quote from uh, Matthew's book that, that I think um, ties into that. That was was referring to, uh, at the time, the pre president of the AA, the Architectural Association. And it said that uh, he proposed that while, while student architects required knowledge of building trades and technologies, they did not actually need to know how to build a brick wall, lay a stone floor, or construct a timber frame. And instead, that making a scale model offered students the knowledge of the building site and various crafts without the mastery of the technique. That's on page 127 for anyone that's interested. Um, so <laughs> I thought that was a really good quote, and I kind of um I I agree with that that kind of assessment of what you know what the value of the workshop is uh to students uh now as well as then i think it's very relevant that the, the reason um models still exist and the, and I, why i think it's so important to still exist in architectural education is that at the end of the day that the built world is real you know it's physical it's 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 something that we we move within and that we can actually uh uh, engage with and touch and so whilst there is all these you know digital advances in all sorts of things uh all sorts of uh computer software and uh, mediums um it, you know we're still human and that that kind of physical touch and being engaged with things to actually have an idea about how they function i think is something that the, the physical model making continues to offer um students of architecture and so that's that's what we try and we try and push and make sure that we still have that that access to them and it is it is getting harder and harder i'd say to to sort of get people out of their shell to do that they really want to do it when given the opportunity but i think because particularly after the last few years of um uh, lockdowns and, and covid restrictions etc people became even more distanced from this idea of actually getting your hands dirty and touching uh the things that you're working on so um yeah from from my perspective i think that that quote is is up is as relevant like now as it is is then in terms of what's valuable about the workshop yeah i i that's a great question david yeah and i, I agree i mean i agree to answer scott's part of the question as well to contribute to scott's part of the question as well i completely ag agree with scott and i think that this um the quote is nice because it's very revealing I think about actually in some ways what architecture is to some extent or architecture can be to architecture students and the models um you know thankfully no one has to build their student work when they're um, an architecture student you know and there is the possibility of getting things wrong and failure and making models to understand what they're doing um and I think a lot of students get very comfortable with orthographic drawing or they get very comfortable with rhino and those are really important skills but there's often a minute that, a moment that they haven't looked necessarily or they don't really understand their what they're doing three-dimensionally 
whether that's the scale of a room or whether that's something urbanistically, um, until they've made a model and then they perhaps realize it. Um, and I think that is a kind of incredibly powerful thing that B15 does with the students. Um, it allows them the, 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 the kind of space of um, failure or testing in a way that I'm not sure sketching does always, or orthography drawing does. Um, to return to the 19th century for a minute, I think there's a part of it where professionalism is so significant, or formation, you know, is so significant that whatever the book had been about, or whatever my PhD had been about, I might have had to explore professionalism, right? You know, like if it was about the building industry, and it was about um, patents in the building industry, or if it was about subcontracting the building industry, or if it was about um, infrastructure. I think still then there would always have to be this undercover of it. I think what's interesting in a way with the model is, um, unlike perhaps other things like I've just talked about, like orthographic drawing, um, to some extent, everyone thinks they understand the model. And I think that this makes it very tricky and slippery in the eyes of the public um, when these things, how these, you know, there is a lot in this book about how, who is the best placed expert to understand the built environment? Uh, and why is it the architect in the architect's opinion? And then also um, this idea of um, how should, who, sh who gets to look at the model? Who makes the model? Who gets to look at the model? How is the model displayed and viewed and used? And I think that this is a kind of key part of it. And these debates rage on and on um, throughout the 19th century and still do today around who has the power to, uh, to judge what's going on in the built environment. I think that um, there's, there's sort of a lot of crossovers um, I, for me, like re reading reading the book, there's there's I'm constantly because I'm not I'm not a historian uh, and I don't have the kind of uh, knowledge that, that that you've you've picked up through this map. But I just draw so many parallels with, that still they're still totally relevant, you know, today um, in in an educational sense. But I, I think in a, a sort of a architect in the architect's profession um, as well. Um, and I think like you mentioned there about like who gets to who gets to actually make the decision about who does this. And it's this something that we're really interested in and we want to uh, allow our students to engage with that that kind of thing where where they can in practice, which is a some project that we're we're working on at the moment um, uh, to try and try and put that all in one place. Um, but. I think David would, um, well, I'll ask David, but I think I'd probably agree that like there's in terms of displaying things um, and who gets to who gets to choose uh, what that is and who sees it. Uh, we have we have that problem all the time. There's like we've got so much so much stuff, so many models, um, you know, very big schools. So we can't keep it all. And so there comes a time where we have to decide what is valuable, what's worth keeping, what what do we what do we retain as as a as a teaching aid, and what do we what do we get rid of or, or you know recycle to the best of our ability with it? Um, and I would say that similarly to um, and one of the reasons why a lot of the the models you refer to in the presentation uh, are no longer around is that they 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 take up space and that people eventually get sick of them and they think well we've got to get rid of them that's in the way collecting too much dust or it's just in the way so so they unfortunately they, many of them don't survive and we have to make that that kind of decision on a on a uh, probably several times a year um you know as the as the the store gets full um so yeah i mean i because I, I studied at the university where david teachers and and they had precedents you know models that were on display um uh, and it was always like if your model got in there that was like you'd made it if, if it got in the, your model got in the case that was like everybody wants to have their their thing it's there still but it's still that way <laughs> so um i mean david how uh, do you do you still have these issues of uh uh storage and like who makes the decisions about that that kind of thing um down there we do but i suppose it's 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 very different because so obviously in your world for both of you up in Manchester, you're looking at model making um really by architects, certainly in terms of the education, it's architects making where I'm 
teaching model makers to do the work on behalf of the architect. So there's a less of a perceived cultural value to the models that our students produce because they're learning aids for the techniques, whereas the the you they're expressions of architectural ideas. So um that hierarchy can be debated, I think, as to whether the, the sort of the ideas of architecture are more important than the the, the skills of, of making, for example. But as a sort of dummy runs, because our students are making models of things that have already been built or or are yesterday's news um, to experiment with their, their process. But um, you know, the research I'm doing at the moment is looking at how what what there's a there's a risk that when we don't record these models from the past, they we lose a huge insight into what people were thinking. Um, and that is either architects' models or model makers' models. It's sort of relevant who's made them. It's, it's, it's the amount of information they, they, they capture. And I think you know what Matthew did really well in this book is, is teasing out these stories of, of these models that you know they're 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 you know you're talking about sort of 1820s models you're talking about 200 years ago to try and find the stories around these and that's so rare and actually for me it's how we how we continue that today how do we um keep the stories of models today so that in 200 years time someone can look back and say right because scott you're going to have an architect a student that in 30 years time is going to be the new norman foster the new Dana leaveskind and suddenly their work they did in your workshop is going to be incredibly important. Um, and those to be running fairly close in time. Paul, you've got your hand up. Did you want to ask a question? Mm. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask a question, you know, and, um, back to, um, you know, the, 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 the book and, and some of the, the elements that were touched on during the discussion. In kind of reaching back to that comment that was made uh, about the who gets to view, who gets to use, and such like that. Do we view this time period in this 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 Victorian London, where which was pretty much an intellectual hub uh, of the time and had this this fast growth of, of the int intellectual uh, status at, at the time, grasping these models and using it as a tool, and so from the outside looking in, less the architects that were creating the models or the model makers creating the models or using it at that time, but actually the growth of the of the business world, uh, where which this time period was very much a, a hub for finding this new tool in order to drive business and in, in order to drive even government and and all those applications. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I think because it's Britain, commerce and culture and politics are always deeply intertwined. I would say that there is a shift, like if, I, if I'm if i thinking very big picture, there is clearly, and I think I talk about this in the book, there is a shift from um, almost an autocracy where access to models is restricted and um, the you know members of the royal family, kings and princes are involved in seeing in these models and in decisions. And they, you know, sometimes a model is made with two different facades. So the king can decide which which sort of gallery he wants for the nation. And this shifts because of the way the politics shift towards, um, I guess, what we would now call more of a populist agenda, whereby um, as soon as you begin to have greater enfranchisement, you get... Um, provincial England having questions. So there's, there are debates around whether, you know, there's lots of um, members of parliament who represent their local communities who say, why should we in Lancashire or we in Northumberland or us in the Midlands pay for these buildings in London? These don't need to be like this. And so monetary NUSP comes in. Um, and also, like you say, the, the world of business comes in. There are discussions around how much of London and how much development can be controlled because, you know, the state is only in control of, say, 20 percent or 30 percent of the land and the rest of the land is to do with private enterprise. And then that's where I think the kind of discussions around courtrooms and architectural models and model makers working in courtrooms becomes increasingly important, where actually there was this whole world going on um where the work is not you know signature buildings 
Um, but there is a whole series of kind of everyday, uh, you know, architecture and model making being used in these spaces and um, uh, disputes put to bed, you know, I hope. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? Bruce? You mentioned that there was um, public discourse through newspapers and things about models and the public reaction to them, not just to the project, but to the model itself. And um, I'm curious if, if anyone has or could collect that, because that'd be a pretty interesting thing for model makers to read. But we, we had our models out there and um, we started getting a bunch of um, flack about what they were made of and how they were not a convenient scale or whatever. That'd be pretty interesting for model makers, I think. Yeah, I mean, my, I mean, I did lots of keyword searching. I mean, because all of, I mean, I'm lucky to be, to have done this research in the, you know, the third, second decade of the millennium where everything is, um, you know, everything is, is digitized. So I was able to keyword search lots of, um, lots of, um, for particular models, particular model makers, then model in general to try and understand how are things discussed. Um, and there are all there are, I mean, as well as there's this emerging as well as like this printed press, which is, you know, you know, is uh, the newspapers that everyone is reading all around the country. There's also this specialist press that's emerging, you know, for engineers, for architects, for like gentlemen, for gentlewomen that begin to talk about these things. Um, and these are kind of areas in which the, you know, they occasionally will have a kind of special, not a special issue, but there'll be an article just about model making. And there'll just be an article about, um, and so often there'll be these things, they will often also have like um, uh, a little series of drawings that help you assemble a model of a Gothic cathedral and tell you how to do it. Um, and, and these only increase as you get across the 19th century, I guess as there's more and more print media. Yeah. Well, we are a few minutes over, but if anybody else has a question, do you guys have, can you stick around for like two or three more minutes? Okay, great. Well, yeah. we'll see if anybody else has a question. I've got one, but uh, figure I'll wait and see if any of our, any of our quiet guests here have, would like to chime in. All right. Well, if anybody does raise your hand and we'll, we'll work in. So I did have a question real quick about there was a subject you brought up earlier and I forget who the who the architect was but it sounded like there was some contention over the notion of whether the architect themselves should be practicing model making or if that should be done by a specialist did that back then was was one more normal than the other I mean if there was contention I assume there was you know around those lines and then how is that different you know today do you find uh i david david might jump in and, and correct me but i at the because he's done a, you know a lot of work on this as well but the um it's the i think the similarities to today are that so much is um so much in the 19th century was put out under a particular architect's name it's this architect doing this work but of course there's a whole series of people on a construction site doing a lot of the building and, and they're organized in a particular way. And then in their architect's office, there's a series of draftsmen producing those drawings and a kind of clerk of works who's kind of working out how much the building costs. And there's also an engineer somewhere maybe who's maybe involved. And the model maker, the model maker therefore is kind of a part of that. And at times it's someone in the office, um, but then there are a lot of the time it's this third party who is um, who's kind of subcontracted in and they come from different disciplinary backgrounds. So they sometimes what they do primarily is they're stonemasons or primarily they're plasterers. But occasionally, if you pay them enough money, they come in and will, you know, they will make this thing for you. Um, there are also examples of sculptors like I talked about who come and make these things um, that does appear to be in the middle of the 19th century, people who are making their money primarily off making architectural models and their 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 work is actually like the days and there's a guy called Dighton as well they're they're really like um fetid in the press they're really like celebrated as being good model makers and like 
And so this is kind of considered okay. With the prior example, what becomes interesting is that he's so declarative over he's, you know, it's, it's, it's basically he's made a conceptual sculpture and that this is what he, you know, he thinks this is what architects need to do in order to regain a relationship with the material world, to step away from um, more uh, proprietary methods of construction. And it's, this is a really big moment. Um, and then gets taken up, um, I argue, gets taken up by German modernists in the 20th century. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question? Sorry, Michael. Yeah, totally does. All right, well, uh, any other questions before we before we wrap up? Just uh, say further to um, to the point that Matthew was just talking about that, like where this trying to understand who does this in practice um, is uh, right now it's something that we're we're, we're quite in, interested in and we're working on. Um, we're, we're trying to put the put together a kind of a an index of uh, model makers and, and practices focused mainly around architectural practice um, to understand uh, to what degree can our graduates actually do this when they go in to that that world? And um, if you if you have a look on our on our blog, there's a kind of registration of interest link there. If you if you kind of sign up, we'll we'll kind of keep you involved in in touch with you know what's what's actually going on with it. But the idea is that we we're able to give our students um, a bit more of a roadmap to find the the sort of places that they would like to work because there's plenty out there. But the the general consensus uh, is that people see it as something that they don't do anymore. But in reality, it's just not the case. Um, and so many places that do it. Um, and so we're really interested to try and capture that and figure out um, uh, which places are allowing the, the the architects to engage with it more. Whereas there's certain um, offices that... Um, David will probably know more than, more than I do about that. The current offices that that just employ model makers, and so they don't actually allow the architects to to kind of get their hands on it, so to speak. They'll have a professional model maker in house that, that that does that, and there's there's certainly quite a few of them in, in the UK, and I'm I'm sure America and and abroad. Mm -hmm. That's why. Yeah, I don't know if it's necessarily the norm over here, but it seems just from my experience with you know, this association, it seems like most of the architectural model makers, you know, their members are primarily, that's what they're doing. They're not architects, they're model makers that you know, work for an architecture firm. So seems yeah. to be a trend here anyway. And that's always a challenge for us too, is trying to come up with, you know, what all careers and professions are hiding out there that are doing model making work or tangent, you know, skill set type work. So, you know, as an organization, with an educational element, we're we're definitely always kind of on the search for that as well, just to try to make sure we can make inroads wherever we can to, you know. I think it's the same. I think it's exactly like what Matthew just said. I think you've got people that trained in completely different things, but make models, but ne never really recognized it as being a profession. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly when I started studying the degree down where David teaches, to me, I just love making things. And I didn't really realize there was a career in it. I just stumbled into it and it was that degree that introduced me to this idea that oh there is a profession out there and you can you know there's pathways for you uh if, if you want to pursue this so uh, the more that you can we can kind of get that um available for people to see what these options are i think i think the better and just bring as many people together with it yeah i just echo that just quickly i think it, we are inundated um and i think all the universities in the UK that teach model making to degree level, there is more work out there than we have graduates. We simply cannot get enough students in the door to put out the other end in architecture and film, um, you name it. Um, yeah, so the, the the more the world knows that architect, well, we just did it today, we just had um, uh, a school of 11 year olds um, in showing them how to make basic architectural models. They loved it. They had no idea that you could do this as a career. So the more the world hears that you can be a model maker, the more there will be. That's a very optimistic note to end on. I would say, uh, can't produce model makers fast enough to fill the demand. Let's 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 hope that trend continues. 
All right. Well, I guess it's a, let's go ahead and wrap it up then. And, uh, I will turn off the recording now, uh, but thank you all so much for joining us. It's been a really cool discussion and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see some of you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks for the invite. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, have a great day. Really nice to meet you. Yeah, you as thank well. Thank you very much, you guys.